Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to have this opportunity and appreciate, appreciate it. I wanted to start by giving a quick uh, tour of our building and then starting to talk about the resources and services that we have available. So I'm going to show my screen. We are on Beacon Street, just across the street, diagonally from the State House. And um, the building we're in is actually our fifth home. The library was founded in 1807, but this building was constructed in 1849. and originally had three stories, as you can see here. Today, uh, we have five stories, and our building is still very much in use. And um, we also are starting in in hybrid mode. We've got um, people coming into the library by appointment. We also are doing a lot of virtual programming right now. So we um, are not in the same situation as schools, but are, are struggling and trying to creative problem solve our way through some of the similar um, challenges. The picture you see on the right is our first floor space where we do in-person events when we can. Um, it's also a space that we can use with students when field trips are possible. That first floor though was originally a sculpture gallery when the library opened in this building in 1849. The whole first floor was dedicated to sculpture. Um, it must have been quite the crowded scene. <laughs> Our second floor is our, a library floor, always has been. And it's also the location of our special collections reading room, which I'm in right now. It is directly to Little Nell, who's here in the foreground, to her right, our left, the door right there. Those glass doors is our special collections reading room. We are- Anna, Yep. To interrupt, I think you need to push present. Uh-oh. Because I still see just the first page, it's in um, your slides, so I'm just still seeing. Really? That's very curious. I only see your um, your first slide. The I yellow and orange. And on, right, and then on the side, I see the other slides, but like the way you would like in a deck, like I can't see them up close. Yeah, let me stop sharing and reshare because. That seems like it got stuck somewhere. And I want to see the inside. <laughs> there you go. No, it won't. There. Did it advance? Excellent. Thank you for interrupting me and telling me that that happened. I really appreciate it because I was chugging along and seeing my different slides. So I appreciate the heads up. So there's our building at the turn of the century. Here's the inside of our building. That's the first floor space that I was mentioning. And our whimsical red doors at 10 and a half Beacon Street. And our sculpture gallery when the building opened. So that whole first floor was filled with plaster casts. The idea that you know not everybody could afford the grand tour in Europe to study art, and so artists needed a place where they could study architecture and classical art. And so the, the great huge plaster cast came in. Our second floor, where we are now, is library floor and always has been since the building opened. And our special collections reading room, right through those glass doors on Little Nell's right. Uh, is where I am now and where if you wanted to assign a student to come do research, they, we would set them up. We are doing research appointments in person. We've limited the capacity of our reading room from eight to two people at a time, but we are happy to accommodate research requests from teachers and students. And I'll go into more of that in a minute. Um, our third floor was originally our paintings gallery. Today, it's also a library floor. And our fourth floor houses um, our trustees room, which is a meeting space. We also hang artwork there. That's the photo on the right. 
And it is also the room where we have, uh-oh, I missed that photo, hold it up. Uh, George Washington's library. We, we are very fortunate that we have about one third of George Washington's personal library in our collection. And we'll take a look at one of the items from that library in just a minute. Um, it's housed in this room. The books in it, they're, they're in a, a locked bookcase, but they are available to researchers, including students. Our fifth floor is just the beautiful floor. Um, it's a silent reading room for our members, and um, it's some of the most highly sought after real estate in Boston. Those tables, <laughs> people, people show up early to get a seat at one of those tables. We are open, as I said, to members, our whole building, um, by appointment, and membership is open to everyone. So that's a quick walk through the building, but I wanted to talk about some of the resources that we have available to you um, virtually, digitally, and then also talk about how you can get students in to see the real thing, because we're always big fans of seeing material in person. We have a digital collection. Um, about 13,000 items are in our digital collections and you can search them, um, sort of regular catalog searching, or you can browse them by category or by their collection name. A lot of the materials in our special collection um, are really good at supporting US history, but we also have materials that can support government, civics, and even European history. We're a little weaker on global history, but European and US history are, are strong and very strong in the US, I would say. Digital collections, um, the materials that have been digitized over time, the priority has to do with what is not available digitally elsewhere. So, for example, we have Common Sense by Thomas Paine in our collection, but somebody else has digitized that and it's, it's relatively easy to get a hold of. So the things that we're digitizing are things that are more unique to our library. And if you are looking for something and you can't quite get your hands on it, but you know it's in our catalog, let me know and I can help you track it down. And this is just a couple of examples of materials in those digital collections. We're very fortunate to have recently acquired a pair of photograph albums that had been owned by Harriet Hayden, um, who was an abolitionist on Beacon Hill in the 19th century. She and her husband, Lewis, of course, um, were very active in the abolition movement and uh, were um, opened their home, house as part of the Underground Railroad. So this photograph album is one of two, and it is a who's who of the abolition movement. And we are very fortunate to have it in the collection now, and it is 100% fully digitized. Uh, this photograph here is of Robert Morris, who was an attorney in Boston. And um, the digital collections have the images um, digitized as you see this one, where it shows what it looks like on the album page. It also has the photograph removed from the album page so that you can see front and back um, to see if there's any writing on it or to see the full image. So that's a great uh, resource. We also have, for example, World War II posters. This one comes from um, the Richard Cheek collection. It's an entire collection of materials related, graphics materials, particularly related to World War II. I chose this one because it's not every day that you see a U.S. war bonds poster with Yiddish on it. Um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. I just wanted to pull out a couple of examples. We are also doing virtual class visits, and I'm going to demonstrate in a few minutes like, some of how we can do that. Uh, Basically, we can work with you to identify probably up to five different items from collections that you want your students to see. And I can work with you to develop activities, guiding discussion questions for that virtual visit. We use Zoom just like this. 
And then we can either do, depending on the size of your class and how you want it structured, we can either do a whole group discussion or we can do combination of group discussion and breakout sessions so that students can look, um, have an opportunity to look at things live with the document camera and also look at photos up close and really get detailed um, investigation of those materials. On the screen, you're seeing um, diary pages from Ezekiel Price in 1776. On July 3rd, he talked about going to Boston, nothing remarkable, save probability of the smallpox spreading, so everything old is new again. And uh, on Saturday, July 13th, he went to Boston where he heard news of the Declaration of the Continental Congress for Independence. One of my favorites. I always think if it took nine days to get important news now, well, where would we be? I should mention virtual class visits cost $5 per person, um, but we bill after the program happens, so you only pay for the people who actually attend. If you've got a kid who's out sick or somebody can't make it, we'll only bill you for the number of people who actually participate. In order to pull materials for class visits, um, we encourage you to create a, an account in our special collections system that allows us, uh, you to choose materials directly for your class and tell us what you want. Um, and then we can also do the same and we can collect all of the, the materials that you want in one place. And you can see when you go into the catalog, if you request you, you find a, an entry that you like. This is the entry for Ezekiel Price's diary. There's a button at the bottom uh, that says request an appointment. And if you have connected with me and set up a virtual visit, I will create what's called an activity in our system. And you can request, click that button, request an appointment and request it specifically for your class. It'll go straight to that activity. And, um, Registering in this system is very easy, but um, if you have questions about it, you can contact me or our reference librarians at reference at bostonathenean.org. Um, you can see the previous slide um, is a link. If, you, if you're on our website um, and you go to research appointments, you'll get to here. And I also have a handout that I will share with you um, that's in the folder. Does everybody have access to that folder? They should, okay. Um, sure. Great, so there's a handout in there that has links for all of these things also. The other thing that we can do is have you assign a visit to the library as homework. So we can do this either as a standalone offering or in tandem with a virtual class visit. If you've done a virtual class visit and there's five items, we can keep them on hold and let students come in and see them on their own. Or we can simply choose materials and you can assign students to come at their convenience to, to look at those materials. Our reading room hours are somewhat limited and we are absolutely able to make arrangements for your students to come outside of our regular reading room hours. So don't, if you are on our website and you see the reading room is only open technically one to seven on Tuesdays and 10 to four Wednesday through Friday, that's true. And also I'm happy to make arrangements for your students to come outside of those times. Our, the library is open until eight o'clock on Monday through Thursday and until five on Friday and Saturday. So we can be flexible about, about time. We would choose, I would work with you to choose items uh, that are appropriate for your class. We would treat your students like any other researcher. We'd set them up in the research reading room. They would have the ability to handle the material, to study it up close, and we would support them um, in terms of knowing how to handle it and, and work with it appropriately.
before we get into the conversation for planning for the future, I did just want to show you a few materials that I pulled out. Um, it's really just show and tell because I want to demonstrate how we can work with the, uh, a virtual class visit. So I would recommend that you pin the special collections camera. I think I can spotlight it for you. There we go. Um, so most of the material that I sh included in the slideshow really speaks to U.S. history, civics, and government. We do have some materials related to European history, if that's something you teach. Um, and I just happen to really love this book, so I pulled it out. Uh, this is called Gart der Gesundheit from 1536, and it's a classification. It's sort of a piece of the history of science, history of biology, and um, of course, this is before Linnaeus, so we have um, not the classification that we would expect to find today, but we have animals, birds, sea creatures, and rocks is the fourth classification. Um, it's all in German, and you get a, a chance to see some of the great animals or, or how they, they expected animals to look. Um, one of the fun things about this book is that um, it's clear that the people who produced it did not see all of these animals in person themselves. Mermaids are very much included in this book. Um, here we've got a, a wonderful example of an animal that I don't think anybody actually saw in person, but managed to get depicted in this book. And this is, again, another example of where seeing things um, on screen, we can get nice and up close. Uh, but if you wanted your students to come in and see it in person, they'd have an opportunity to feel that 16th century paper that's so much higher quality than what we're accustomed to today. And we'll just skip forward, as I mentioned. We've got... Um, about one third of George Washington's personal library in our collection. And this is um, a collection of pamphlets or tracts that he had bound together. And this one includes his copy of Common Sense by Thomas Paine. Right here on the front cover, we see that he signed his name. Um, Washington, unfortunately, was not a big annotator, so we don't know what he thought of it. He didn't make any comments in the margins or underline anything. Um, but it is a piece of American history that's here at the Athenaeum. If we jump to the 19th century. Along with the Harriet Hayden albums that I mentioned earlier, um, we also have supporting materials. So we have some papers from Robert Morris himself, not just his photographs. And this is an example of a petition um, that he drafted um, specifically asking the legislature to remove the word white from the militia law. Um, so we're, they're asking for a change to the law. Sorry, that wobbled a little bit. Um, and you can see the names of the people who signed on to this petition. There's more inside. Um, yeah, this speaking about U.S. history, certainly state history, as well as uh, sort of the national question of rights for people of color. We have a visual material as well as textual material in the collection. Uh, we looked at a stereograph on the slideshow of that first floor statuary hall. 
this is another stereograph card. Uh, 3D is not new. Our 19th century predecessors also enjoyed a good 3D image. And put this in a little stereo finder and, and look at it. Um, but this is specifically an image, oops, sorry, there's a little glare, um, of Chinese workers outside of Samson's shoe factory in 1870. Uh, this is an important piece of immigration history and labor history here in Massachusetts and um, is also an art historical moment too, social history. Please feel free to jump in, ask questions, ask for a different view of any material. Hannah? Yep. Um, the petition or the letter that Robert Morris wrote, what can, what was that in reference to again? It says to the Honorable Senate and House of Representatives. I don't know if I can read manuscripts upside down, but I'll try. Okay. So, <laughs> the Honorable Senate and House of Representatives of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the undersigned, nope, can't read it up with it, uh, respectfully pray that the word white may be struck out of the militia law of this commonwealth. Okay. Ooh, my camera got stuck for a second there. There we go. Thank you. Sure. And if we jump into the 20th century, we have material related to voting and the, the fight for women's suffrage. We also have materials related to um, the 15th Amendment as well as the 19th. So if you're looking for material around reconstruction, we have a huge Civil War collection. Um, so there are materials that speak to that um, passage of the 15th, voting rights for African Americans, as well as the 19th Amendment and voting rights for women. There is currently an online exhibition up called Anti-Suffrage that looks at materials um, specifically around the 19th Amendment, but both the cases for and against suffrage. And that's on our website. It's a very small but thoughtfully put together online exhibition. And the last item I pulled out is just a set of handouts that are from 1963 um, from the NAACP that are providing information to people. They were handed out in front of the school committee building and in front of the state house um, about desegregating schools in Boston and busing and why people should care. And it's a, a small collection, but it lays out the arguments for desegregating um, and calls for people to to be interested and to support to support busing. Do you have any other materials at the Athenaeum that are related to the Boston NAACP? I think we do. Um, I can look more closely. I don't know off the top of my head what's there, but it's definitely something I can look up. Um, I just wondered if you knew. I'll see if I could, yeah. But that's a good question to lead us right into the next. Oh, I see there's something in the chat. Oh, thank you for sharing that Google form. So um, we are also interested in planning for the future and thinking about ways that we can continue to expand our offerings and serve you best. I wanted to do that. Uh, 
Um, we are working on putting together primary source sets that we can put up on our website. Our digital collections are awesome and there's a lot of material in there, but they are definitely not organized with teachers in mind specifically. So we are interested in putting together sets that are useful to you. And so one of my questions is what topics are of greatest interest or need for you? Um, and if there are any supporting materials that you'd like to see with a primary source set, what those might look like. Um, I, I'm looking at, um, for, I guess all grade levels from maybe from third grade, maybe into fifth and then eighth and then high school is looking at various, uh, perspectives, um, throughout like in, 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 in many different historical periods or eras. And, and, and definitely, you know, locally um, or state, um, like um, particularly like underrepresented groups. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, we're trying to put together like a, a spreadsheet of the different historical periods or eras, and then having primary source sets um, from various underrepresented groups. So, you know, indigenous people, Native Americans or African Americans, women and children, um, you know, even um, you know, Asian American, Hispanic, Latino, so that you know we we have a a set of because those are hard to find, <laughs> you know, um, whether you're looking at you know American colonies or the Revolution or even during you know uh, the first decade of the United States under the Constitution to the Civil War and so forth. Um, so I didn't know like maybe those could be like primary source sets that would be available. That would be awesome. Um, I don't know. I'm just thinking back to at one point in the past six or seven months, you shared an archive evening where there were three different speakers speaking about the history of the Chinese in the Boston area. Yes. That? Yep. Yep. So that was great. I listen, I watched that and listened to that. that was great. And I wonder whether um, there are materials in the collection um, that would support understanding better the history of um, Chinese immigration to the Boston area. Um, because, you know, to share the speak as a, from a teacher's perspective, listening to the three, three speakers was really informative, but it's not something they could really share with at least, you know, upper elementary, maybe high school kids. Um, so I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's something that you have. Um, certainly, um, the, we do a big uh, unit on abolitionists and suffrage, the abolitionist movement and the suffrage movement. So I know you have materials, so I guess it would just be thinking about, um, you know, carefully thinking about what to put into that uh, primary source set. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I think kids, uh, or students really like when they can see um, letters and diary entries um, that, of course, you know, usually have to have a transcription so that they can yeah. read them because they're written in cursive. Yeah. Um, but those things that offer a window into um, the lives and the thinking of people from different uh, times. Um, one of the things that I've been trying that I have, I was going to reach out to the Cambridge Historical uh, Commission around this, but um, in the fifth grade, when we look, after we look at the civil rights movement, we look at um, other movements of groups of people who, um, who have fought to have their, to feel respected and have their rights um, 
recognized in the United States. And what I wanted to do with that was to show images of what those, what that looked like in the, in the Cambridge area or the Boston area, right? Like um, maybe the first um, gay rights, you know, pride parade in Boston, you know, like just looking for things that would show that when you're studying a movement that you can find, um, you can find evidence of what it looks like right in your community. Um, so. If you don't already know about them, I recommend the History Project for LGBTQ history locally. Oh, okay. No, I don't know about them. They're a tiny organization, but um, but they are dedicated to documenting LGBTQ plus history in Boston. Okay, Adrian probably does. I'm just. <laughs> um. So I'm just sort of think like, and I'm not familiar enough yet with um, uh, what the high school teachers' needs might be, but I can certainly, I'll certainly be speaking to uh, people who work with the high school teachers and um, getting some ideas from them that I can share with you, Hannah. That'd be great. And I see in the chat um, whether there's a question about whether we've had the idea of having teachers come in to compile, brainstorm, and put document sets together. I would love to do that. Um, and if you are interested in something like that, I would love for you to email me and uh, we can maybe set something up. I, I think that would be a great idea. We, we've had a few different um, projects over the years and, and have had teacher input that way, but um, a more concerted effort would be awesome. Uh, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention our virtual, not virtual, <laughs> everything is virtual now, our annual workshop for teaching with primary sources. Um, next year's topic it, it will be in July next year, and next year's topic is abolition and the Underground Railroad. Um, and we, out of last year's workshop and this year's, we have lesson plans that teachers have put together that I am still working on getting published to our website, but it, it is not forgotten. <laughs> you know, the other thing that I was thinking about, at least with um, high school teachers, but also middle school to some extent, was having teacher develop their own uh, document-based question. Um, whether they're as, a, as an assignment or as an assessment, you know, because um, particularly, especially with, with advanced placement um, courses, teachers are always looking for, uh, you know, document-based questions. But I was wondering if there was an opportunity where teachers could, you know, um, go to the Athenaeum or using the, the digital, uh, digital resources to develop document-based questions. So maybe a program where teachers learn how to develop a document-based question using those resources gives them a greater appreciation of what a document-based question, you know, how, how it's constructed for, for assessment purposes. I like that idea. That's great. Great. Are there other uh, services or resources that you're looking for that that are missing from the landscape? So I don't know, like how what what their plans are for this year, but. The National History Day, they often, you know, have those annual um, projects and showcase and, you know, competitions. I, I don't know exactly what their <laughs> plans are for this year. All but, virtual this year. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, another opportunity is to really maybe focus on what their 
the theme is for this year and then trying to um, appeal to, to students, you know, in terms of looking at the local lens, uh, you know, with that theme mm -hmm. and maybe offering a program for students if they're, you know, thinking about what kind of project they want to put together and then how to utilize the resources at the Athenaeum. Yeah. Oh, it just occurred to me because I remember now there's somebody, you have two women who are going to be looking at um, some of the first ballots that were used in the United States. Is that right? Yeah, that was just last night, actually. Yep. Oh, I missed it. Um, we recorded it. It should oh, be up soon. Okay. But maybe a primary source set around um, elections in some way. Mm. Um, that's definitely something that high school teachers would be able to use or, or a civics, you know, civics yeah. classes. Um, that's great. I forget that that's something that we actually care about all of the time and not just this month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> I think everybody, Everybody I talk to is like, right, I'm just looking forward to November, whatever date, when it's done. <laughs> well, it's also, we've had, just in speaking with people about how to fit teaching and teaching about the elections into their crazy curriculums that are already, you know, have been like chopped in half by what you can right. get this year. And so, anyway. Um, The, the only other thought, and I don't know, this is not so much, um, I guess it depends on how long we're in the land of virtual remote teaching. Um, like, and, and this is maybe more like um, somebody who could take videos and chop them up into, you know, edit them into smaller um, takeaways, but, um, like how I was mentioning that the three speakers about the history of the Chinese in Boston was, you know, like how, if somebody could take some of your archived videos maybe and um, um, edit them down. You know, like one of the things that PBS does is in PBS media learning, they've taken clips from their larger videos mm -hmm. so that they can be shared with students. Um, that's like a whole another project but what is a good length for a clip for students um i think three to five minutes so we've been using a lot of ed puzzle um which is an app that we can if if you have a video that you can actually download or upload you know then you can edit it yourself um and you can put in questions reflective questions you can embed them into it um but um but i don't know what do you think lee i mean with with younger kids upper elementary even like three to five minutes um like three to five minutes is perfect i think yeah <laughs> yeah i think it's perfect yeah yeah the, and the, yeah and puzzle we use it a lot teachers love yeah. it um, yeah good to know. yeah it's great so yeah three to five minutes is pretty good yeah, but like, you know, the, I don't remember the man's name, but when he shared the photograph, um, I'm going back to the Chinese in Boston again, and he said, you know, he shared a photograph and he said, this little boy here is, um, I don't know if he said it was, it was him or whether it was, it reminded him of himself arriving from San Francisco in Boston, like those little pieces of videos can can be really powerful for teaching. That's great. The, I appreciate that suggestion because it's not something we have ever thought about. So it's always good to get the, the fresh idea that hasn't been kicked around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you've you've had wonderful, you know, speakers over the years. So there might be pieces of archived footage. Could you talk a little bit about in terms of, um, you know, when teachers are looking at various 
sources, digitized sources. Um, and, and of course, you know, they're all now doing virtual things. <laughs> um, could you talk a little bit about, you know, the, the permissions of using digitized sources? I mean, many I would assume are using Google Classroom, which is kind of closed off. You know, you have to put in a password in order to access those. But some teachers might like use, um, you know, like Google Sites. So now it's open for public viewing. But can you talk a little bit about what teachers should keep in mind, what they should or should not do when using um, digitized sources, as long as they're cited, maybe then that's okay. Or can you talk Absolutely. a little bit about that. Yeah, so most of the material on our digital collections is public domain material. It's old enough that we're not worried about copyright anymore. And in that case, fair use is, you know, pretty much anything is fair game. We always love a citation um, and or a link back is always also nice. There are some materials in the digital collections that are newer. Um, anything that's younger than 72 years old, I think, um, is, is subject to copyright or, or can be subject to copyright. So if you've got something that's newer, um, you know, educational use generally is considered fair use. And if you're not making money off of it and you're not charged, yeah, it, Kind of comes down to not making money off of it and not um, using it in its entirety to avoid purchasing it. Um, you're pretty good to go. So if you find it on our digital collections, you can assume that it's fair to use with your students in any way that you see fit. Um, a citation is always nice, but even that, I mean, we're not going to come after you. And we can help, we can help if you need um, guidance on how to cite something, right? Like, how do you cite a letter, a manuscript, or a, you know, this random piece of ephemera in the collection? We can help with that, too. Our reference librarians are the best. Great. So do you also have audio and video um, collections? Very limited. Okay. Um, we have, most of what we have that's audiovisual is recordings of our own events. Right. And that we have both um, video and podcast format. Mm -hmm. um, and that's available on our website. That's on the handout, actually, a link to that. But in terms of actual collections items that are video or audio, very, very few, and none of them are digitized. We, uh, we've really invested in the print material. <laughs> if you also, um, like if your students did come in to, to look at materials, or if you came in yourself, we do most of the time allow people to take their own photographs. And there's some exceptions with contemporary material. But for the most part, you know, if you came in and you looked at, uh, I don't know, a broadside of the Emancipation Proclamation and you wanted to bring that back to your students, you could photograph that and use that in your classroom without any concern. That's all of the material I have. I'm happy to answer any other questions, but I wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your evening to, to learn about what we've got at the Athenaeum. And please do be in touch if there's anything I can do for you or your students um, or other faculty at your school. I'm always happy to work with people. <laughs>